Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. You're a rough speaker, my friend, but you look an honest, open-hearted man, said the old gentleman, turning his spectacles in the direction of the candidate for Oliver's premium, whose villainous countenance was a regular stamp receipt for cruelty. But the magistrate was half blind and half childish, so he couldn't reasonably be expected to discern what other people did. I hope I am, sir, said Mr. Gamfield with an ugly leer. I have no doubt you are, my friend, replied the old gentleman, fixing his spectacles more firmly on his nose and looking about him for the inkstand. It was the critical moment of Oliver's fate. If the inkstand had been where the old gentleman, though it was, he would have dipped his pen into it and signed the indentures, and Oliver would have been straight away hurried off. But as it chanced to be immediately under his nose, it followed as a matter of course that he looked all over his desk for it without finding it, and happening in the course of his search to look straight before him. His gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of Oliver Twist, who, despite all the admonitory looks and pinches of Bumble, was regarding the repulsive countenance of his future master with a mingled expression of horror and fear, too palpable to be mistaken, even by a, a half-blind magistrate. The old gentleman stopped, laid down his pen, and looked from Oliver to Mr. Limpkins, who attempted to snuff with a cheerful and unconcerned aspect. My boy, said the old gentleman, you look pale and alarmed. What is the matter? Stand a little away from him, Beetle, said the other magistrate, laying aside the paper and leaning forward with an expression of interest. Now, boy, tell us what's the matter. Don't be afraid. Oliver fell on his knees and clasping his hands together, prayed that they would in order they would order him back to the dark room. That they would starve him, beat him, kill him, if they pleased, rather than send him away with that dreadful man. <clears throat> well, said Mr Bumble, raising his hands and eyes with most impressive solemn night. Well, of all the artful and designing orphans that I that ever I see. Oliver, you are one of the most barefacedest. Hold your tongue, Beetle, said the second old gentleman, when Mr. Bumble had given vent to this compound adjective. I beg your worship's pardon, said Mr. Beetle, incredulous of having heard a riot. Did you worship did your worship speak to me? Yes, hold your tongue. Mr. Bumble was stupefied with astonishment. A beetle ordered to hold his tongue? A moral revolution! The old gentleman in the tortoise shell spectacles looked at his companion. He nodded significantly. We refuse to sanction these indentures, said the old man, tossing aside the piece of parchment as he spoke. I hope, stammered Mr. Limpkins, I hope the magistrates will not form the opinion that the authorities have been guilty of any improper conduct on the unspotted testimony of a child. The magistrates are not called upon to pronounce any opinion on the matter, said the old gentleman sharply. Take the boy back to the workhouse and treat him kindly. He seems to want it. That same evening, the gentleman in the white waistcoat most positively and decidedly affirmed, not only that Oliver would be hung, but that he would be drawn and quartered into the bargain. Mr. Bumble shook his head with gloomy mystery and said he wished it might, he might come to good. 
whereunto Mr. Gamfield replied, that he wished he might come to him, which, although he agreed with the beetle in most matters, which seemed to be a wish of totally opposite description. The next morning, the public were once informed that Oliver Twist was again to let, and that five pounds would be paid to anybody who would take possession of him. Chapter 4 Oliver being offered another place makes his first entry into public life. In great families, when an advantageous place cannot be obtained, either in possession, reversion, remainder, or expectancy, for the young man who is growing up, it is a very general custom to send him to sea. The board, in imitation of so wise and salutary an example, took counsel together on the expediency of shipping off Oliver Twist in some small trading vessel bound to a good unhealthy port. This suggested itself as the very best thing that could possibly be done with him, the probability being that the skipper would flog him to death in a playful mood some day after dinner, or would knock his brains out with an iron bar both pastimes being, as is pretty generally known, my favorite and common recreations among gentlemen of that class. The more the case presented itself to the board in this point of view, the more manifold the advantages of the step appeared. So, they came to the conclusion that the only way of providing for Oliver effectually was to send him to sea without delay. Mr. Bumble has been dispatched to make various preliminary inquiries, with the view of finding out some captain or other who wanted a cabin boy without any friends, and was returning to the workhouse to communicate the result of his mission, when he encountered at the gate no less a person than Mr. Sowerberry, the periochial undertaker. Mr. Sowerberry was a tall, gaunt, large-jointed jet man, attired in a suit of threadbare black with darned cotton stockings of the same color and shoes to answer. His features were not naturally intended to wear a smiling aspect, but he was in general rather given to professional jocosity. His step was elastic and his face betokened inward pleasantry as he advanced to Mr. Bumble and shook him cordially. I have taken the measure of two women that died last night, Mr. Bumble, said the undertaker. You'll make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry, said the beetle, as he thrust his thumb and forefinger into the, pro the preferred snuff box of the undertaker, which was an ingenious little model of patent coffin. I say you'll make your fortune, Mr. Sowerberry, repeated Mr. Bumble, tapping the undertaker on the shoulder in a friendly manner with his cane. Think so, said the undertaker, in a tone which half admitted, and half disputed the probability of the event. The prices allowed by the board are very small, Mr. Bumble. So are the coffins, replied the beetle, with precisely as near an approach to a laugh as a great official ought to indulge in. Mr. Sowerberry was, very, was much tickled at this, as of course he ought to be, and laughed a long time without cessation. Well, well, Mr. Bumble, he said at length. There's no denying that, since the new system of feeding has come in, the coffins are something narrower and more shallow than they used to be. But we must have some profit, Mr. Bumble. Well, seasoned timber is an expensive article, sir, and all the iron handles come by canal from Birmingham. Well, well, said Mr. Bumble. Every trade has its drawbacks. A fair profit is, of course, allowable. Of course, of course, replied the undertaker. And if I don't get a profit upon this or that particular article, why, I make it up in the long run, you see. He, he, he. Just so, said Mr. Bumble. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say... Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please, like, 
comment and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care and thanks again.